Okay, everybody, welcome back to our continuing series of agave education, where you get to see Lude Bank drink out of mixing bowls. Uh, I am Pat from the Whiskey Highline at Benny's, along with Brett Pontana. You can explain what that is later, Lou. Sure. Uh, that's got a, our, we've got I our believe that's the panel third, back. The third uh, episode. We've, we've popped a David Ciro this week, and we picked up a Gabo from El Bujo Mezcal. Gabo, thank you for joining us. He kind of, what, I guess manages all the education and uh, whatnot. Yes, thank you so much for the invite, guys. So, everybody, this week, we kind of broke down tequila last week uh, in simple and um, possibly not so simple terms. And we kind of want to take the same approach with Mezcal, but keeping it a little more simple, maybe. And really, uh, what is Mezcal versus tequila? We have, Monique, you mentioned when we were chatting a few minutes ago um, that a lot of people still kind of view Mezcal. It's like, oh, it's smoky tequila. Um, but really, that's not true. And uh, Lou had an interesting thing a couple weeks ago where you had said like, oh, yeah, 1993, all Mezcal, all tequila was Mezcal. But I don't, how did you put that, Lou? So it used to be that people would say all tequila is mezcal, but not all mezcal is tequila because, you know, mezcal, tequila rather, really was an expression of mezcal. But then once uh, there was a certification, um, a, a DO, if you will, um, denomination of origin set by the Mexican government for mezcal, which started in 1994, that whole thing changed. So now they're both just really expressions of agave spirit. But that's, I feel like now, like you've, you've literally given me the opportunity, Pat, to already go way too deep into this. This should be simple. Simple. Keep it simple. What's the difference between tequila and mezcal? That's where we want to start. Uh, well, I suppose first and foremost has to be the agave varietal, right? Because they can be distilled in similar methods and they can be fermented in similar methods if you're going to, you know, take a little more time with your tequila. But at the at the core, though, where tequila has to be made from the Tequilana Blue Weber Agave, uh, Mezcal is pretty wide open, right? Or is there a cap on which agaves they can use? Gabo, take it. Oh. Only Tequilana Weber. For, for tequila, it's absolutely yes. just that. And uh, if you mind, I have a tiny little map that I wanted to show because I thought it could be a little more interactive than just seeing our faces. <laughs> uh, no, nothing wrong with that. But I, I find a, I find a few things that I wanted to share with you guys, if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Love it. Uh, somebody has to let me do it. Uh, let me see. <laughs> Producer Jim has to. Producer Jim. <laughs> Thank you. Got it. <laughs> All right. So. You guys can see this? Yeah. Yeah. So this this map, there's two interesting things when every time we go into like agave spirits, denomination of origins, mezcal making, uh, a lot of people forget that Mexico is a is a country that has a a very important complexity in in, in the spirit making. And so you just have people remember tequila and mezcal easier, but you have a few more things, you have Bacanora, you have Comiteco, you have Raicilla, you have Sotol, you have Tequila. All of this is more or less, and probably there's a subdivision of all of this, uh, this will be like the spirit, Mexican agave spirit universe, to put it very in simple way. That and is the universe that I wish to live in, Gabo. Absolutely, man. <laughs> And the other thing that is important is, as Lou was mentioning, is the denomination of origin and the amount of states that they're in it right now. Uh, so nine out of 32 states in Mexico. Uh, when you say state, it's not necessarily the whole state is in it. It's also by municipalities. So it's a little more regional. They have to do, they have to go through a, a, an extensive process of showing off the history and the background and heritage for uh, mezcal making. Uh, there's a few different states right now in process to do that. Sinaloa, Querétaro, to mention a few of them. And so but, there's there's but, a lot of complexity on that. But, but uh, to put a really fine point on agave, I believe what you're saying is there are only nine states in which you can make an agave spirit and certify it as mezcal. Yeah, that's a, that's a denomination of origin. It, it's a specific to the origin of the where you're gonna bottle and produce that that agave. 
Uh, I do think, I think one of the big, like, miss, um, I don't know, ways in which sometimes people misspeak about tequila is they'll say it can only come from tequila or it can only come from, you know, arandas or, or whatever it is, wherever they're most familiar. So you hear a lot of tequila is not smoky, mezcal is smoky. Tequila can only come from here. Mezcal can only come from Oaxaca. And that's not really no, true. It's, it's way more complex than that. And we will go into like mezcal 20 on 20, like not one on one, if you want to go through that. But this is a very specific thing that I think people, if they can see it and they can visualize it, then we can jump into more specifics. You know, then you can talk about what 90% of the production of mezcal is made in Oaxaca, maybe 80 now, then, you know, the, the tides are moving for other states uh, that they have a very strong mezcal making uh, capabilities like Durango, for example, Michoacan. Um, but in those terms, like I think Oaxaca is, is the perfect term to talk about uh, mezcal one-on-one -on -one because it's the bigger producer. Um, and with that, we can just go with a bunch of different things. I can show a little more if you want me to not share it and then we go back. Uh, weather for me, I think is the most important point because it shows 16 microclimates just to start in one single state. Uh, and with that comes different kind of agaves, different growth cycles, different uh, yield in sugar because they grow different, because they act different, because they're pretty much different plants. Uh, and with this, the terroir is different. With this, you know, everything that we will try to dissect about mezcal will come from these two points. You have the nomination of origin, you have the area as a state, as Oaxaca, if you want a micro, you can go from general to specific, and then we can go to the tiny, tiny specifics of microclimates uh, in the state of Oaxaca. Well, so Gabo, like for example, last week when we were speaking with David and the question came up, like why was Blue Weber agave, like the chosen agave for tequila. At one point in time, it made sense and it was consistent and you knew, you know, it didn't have the longest like growth span and it had a lot of fermentable sugar. Yeah. So with that, mezcal is like a bit, the not opposite, but it's much more expansive. So are there limits to the type of agave that can be used to make mezcal? Uh, not that I know. You know, if you so can... how many types is that? Well, I will, uh, you know, there, there's numbers up to 200 and then 40, that they're being made right now, like it's, it's an on, ongoing expanding list. And you know, one other thing that I forgot to mention that I think is highly, highly important is the yeast. If you have a microclimate, you have a different kind of yeast growing in that, in that area. And therefore, flavor profiles that develop through fermentation are very specific to this part of the process. Love it. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So then too, if you're not using blue Weber agave, so we talked about for those to ripen in like the proper way till the sugar, you know, is like a perfect and everything's really sweet and you're not taking underripe and you're not using diffusers. So what would be the average lifespan of some of these types of agaves and what are some of the common ones that are used in mezcal? Well, Oaxaca has by far, you know, the farming, the farming situation is going to be uh, Angustafolia spadi. And you see it in probably most of the mezcal that is on the market in some way or another, either on an ensemble or in maybe just a dupla, maybe one agave with a mix of espadine. Uh, some of the bigger players in the market has like an espadine with Karwinski and that combination is very specific because Karwinski is uh, endemic to Oaxaca and Puebla. So therefore you have the one that is farm, the one that is wild or semi-cultivated semi uh, and making the most out of that juice. Uh, you know, it, it, gets, it gets very geeky really fast. Mezcal one-on-one -on -one is complicated because we will have to go through the process first. Like if you want, I have a few more images that might help to go through that. Uh, yeah, and, I'd say you can pull up then, some more and, images. And then we can jump to the, to like the more critical part. <laughs> you know, I was going to ask, go ahead. I, I was just going to say that that's great. I would love to see that, but we need to we need to make sure that we keep Ruble in the screen as often as possible so we can see how often he has an open flame near all of that explosive alcohol. <laughs> there so we go, I was, perfect. I was right. going to ask Michael though too. So Michael, as someone who is serving um, not drinks, but also neat pours of mezcal across the bar all the time, 
what percentage of what you're carrying right now and serving right now is espadine, like that angustifolia espadine, which is the most common versus like, you know, is that half and every other type of agave makes up half or what are you seeing in consumption right now? Um, well, sort of two different points uh, in terms of like what, what I have on, on the shelf for sipping. Um, espadine is probably 30%. Oh, wow. But what I buy in volume, of course, is a lot more espadine. So as a percentage of what I'm buying on a monthly basis, I mean, espadine is probably about 80%. There's, there's also, Monica, something, something that is super, super interesting. That is, if you buy 20 different brands that you can now, and they're all made of espadine, I bet you that they all taste different. They all have uniqueness. They right. all have flavors that if you want to do, you can go months doing just espadine flights in a restaurant and it's not ending. You know, it's like, it's, it's even, even bottles from different years, from different batches, from like every single time you open a bottle that is not from the same batch, you're most likely going to have a, a unique experience with espadine. And that makes it amazing, you know, because then you're in a, in a constant, uh, discovery of taste and a, and a constant pursuit of, of something that is constantly changing even that you will have profiles that are similar uh, you will also go with like you know I like better uh, I like my preference or my palate will go with Miwatlan or will go with Santiago Matatlan and, and you can go like regional uh, tasting not notes but profiles I think it's, it will be kind of like only very interesting. And then you go with the, you know, the mezcalero itself that has a whole other part of being the hand on the maker. That is a, a way of saying this, oh. that how they produce their own spirits. And, and that is, I think that with those three elements, you have a combination that is unending. That is pretty amazing. And you could take well, the, same, the same espadine from the same mezcalero in the same pueblo. Yeah. and look at like three batches, three lotes in different months, and you'll have three completely different right. spirits, right? You, know, you want to have a raw material that takes five, six, seven, eight years to grow, so you have all of that variation. And then because you're not using, I'm so sorry. No, sorry, I, I didn't interrupt. Uh, and because you're, you're not using commercialized yeast like you would, like you would pitch it in, in tequila, uh, a, a batch of, Esbarin made in March in Miahuatlan, uh, in the same Palenque in May, will taste completely different. And that's mm -hmm. like endlessly fascinating for us at Estadio. Well, and that also, and that throws, um, it, it makes sense that you can then, why Espadin? So you, you've explained the reasons why Espadin has become sort of the, the, the most common or the reference um, Mage agave to use. It, 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 you're talking about vital. Sorry, for those of you not out there, I'm sitting on a forklift with my. Uh, so, so you're talking about vitality, right? So you, you mentioned before. So you're talking about vitality, ease of access, the fact that it can grow in a lot of different areas with different sugars, can still have regional characteristic. So for a lot of people out there, that's the same way that Chardonnay is different grown in France, Chardonnay grown in Australia, Chardonnay grown. It's, it's all Chardonnay, but once you put it in a different spot and put it in somebody else's hands, it becomes a different wine. And Brett, you know, there's, there's also way more other factors than just the yeast. You have water. You know, is it well water? Is it still water? If it, is, if it comes from a volcanic area, if it is uh, for whatever reason, it goes down the down the hill and he goes to the reservoir and that reservoir happens to be X kind of uh, soil, like every single aspect that it goes, because he's such an artisanal uh, right. spirit. So everything that touches, even the humans, you know, you, you don't right. I know, you know, they, maybe the mescalero carries a very specific yeast because he eats mangoes all summer, you know, so his hands are constantly, you know, touching, uh, organic matter and that will change something you know and and sure. you know there was there was a, an interview that we have been very lucky i've been very lucky i'm working with my wife and uh i i do a, a podcast called hey hey agave 
And we have this amazing interview with uh, Rio from La Estancia that does uh, Raicilla mm -hmm. in Jalisco, Nayarit area. And in, in part of the conversation, he was like, you know, we do three different, uh, three times a year, three different distillations and each of them tastes completely different. And, but they are one of the few mezcaleros that I know, Raicilleros, that he actually uh, looks for the profile by doing a, a, a mix and match of these three different batches uh, and puts the, the general batch to be then housed in, 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 in glass. So even just that, you know, like we don't hear it much, but the profile on each batches as uh, what Michael was saying is, is completely different. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite, you know, we can go just on fermentation and yeast and plants for like two hours. So, <laughs> well, quick question on Espadine itself. Uh, you know, when we were talking tequila, we talked about, you know, generally a five to seven year about maturity for those agaves. Uh, where does Espadine fall on that? You want to jump on that loop? Sure. Like five to eight years, depending. Very you know, and, and I've I've had some communities tell me that as long as ten years. Um, but then you'll also hear in those same communities that their tepestate, uh, which is known as a long growth agave, that's going to take like you know twenty five, thirty five years. They'll tell me that the tepestate takes like twelve years in their community. Hmm. So I, I I always get very confused by the numbers I hear in Mexico. Um, I know it takes a lot longer for the uh, the plants that are used to make mezcal and tequila and all agave spirits the, the agave itself takes significantly longer to reach maturity so that you can access those sugars for the fermentation to make your alcohol right significantly longer than it would take for any other alcohol whether you're talking wine or you're talking whiskey or beer vodka significantly longer that's that's a good you know they the for example, with with Buo that I have, I have access to data that is directly from the Maguellero Mezcalero. Uh, we have a capon that is nine years in the field that I will show you early today. It's okay, well, you just capon. and the, and then you, you, you the, hang on. Can you can you explain capon? I'm getting, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Oh, so sorry. nine years of growth and capon is when the when the plant is gonna. We're gonna we're gonna go back to that. <laughs> the cycle of the plant is very simple. You know, it grows, it grows, it grows, it grows, it grows. It harvests as much sugar as possible. That sugar is gonna become probably the nectar, like the image that Lou has on the back of his screen, and it's gonna shoot this 20 foot, 30 foot high, beautiful flower stalk that all the way on the top is gonna have uh, basically the flowers that they're gonna create life after him. He only blooms once. So all this energy that these plants are always harvesting through their life is going to be interrupted. And all that sugar is going to maintain right on the core of the plant that once you take all the pencas away, it becomes the piña. It's that iconic looking pineapple thing. That's what you end up cooking. Uh, Let's, let me just show some pictures. It's, it's going to be a little bit easier that way. Yeah, I don't have to duck then. Well, it was, it's interesting too, Gabo. We're, the rest of us are Chicago-based. So when you start talking about Capone, people start <laughs> thinking about Al Capone. We have a very different idea of Capone. So we have to be very specific. So plants, just showing a little bit faster. This is when they're harvesting. If you can see, I don't know if you can see my... my uh, mm -hmm. So there's a tiny bit of the stock right here. That is that is one of the plants that it was being cut. Capon, it was left left on the field for a year. So nine years growing, one year on the field. And what it what does what that happens when you do that, you're forcing the plant to concentrate all the energy on the on the piña more than just like cutting it and getting it out. Um, these are some of them, this is Betty. And then if we want, we can start a little bit with the process, just so for people that they don't know absolutely anything, uh, I can show you a few pictures of this. So this I, is yeah. a 10 ton oven 
you can see the process of the using wood. Uh, people use different wood, oak, encino, uh, white oak. There's depending what they have available. Uh, so this is going to be the core that is going to be the core heating element, if you want to call it like that. There, then this cover by stone and bagasso. This bagasso is basically the a byproduct of uh, when they smash and ferment it. This is the byproduct they still have. And it's, a fiber, it's still an agave fiber. So what it does is basically protects the first couple of layers for not getting completely charred. Um, when you do the spell, you're not smoking. You're not uh, fire cooking something. If this is heat, what the main element is going to be a heat, it's almost like a Dutch oven in the ground. Yeah, hey, the Gabo, I was going to say, actually, cooking, right? yeah, I was going to say it actually would be helpful from photograph one to photograph two. So you have the, the wood, then you layer the yeah. stones over it, then you light the wood. So what is the time difference from photo one to photo two? Yeah, yeah. I've seen it done in a full day. So this is like early in the morning, they start putting this, you see the fire, like most of the fit, the pictures that you see Agave making, there's this like super gothic looking like fire at night and this like, they're just turning the, the fire in the pit. It's because it's probably four o'clock in the morning. You know, it's like they, this, as if you were doing a pig, if you were roasting any kind of animal in uh, a pit, it has to be, the fire has to become cold red hot coals in order to maintain the heat that you're going to be doing. Um, then what it happens is all hand labor. Like there's very few machines. There are very few things that you see. You're going to see all is based on humans and hand tools. So the experience, how they, are, how they kind of like arrange the agave, how they're going to make this like giant Tetris wall of agave uh, that is going to be then covered, you know, one of one of these things that it was the first time that I saw the picture on the right, that is like this engineer, like all the soil that you see from here end up up here covering the mountain of agave that you're seeing on this side. That's crazy. What are those logs on top doing? That's just beautiful. It's it's it's, it's such an architecture that it works so beautifully. So this happens for seven, five. 10 days, depending on the area, depending on the weather, depending on the temperature, and depending on the maguey, depending on the amount of maguey, depending on the kind of wood that you're using, if it's hot, if it's cold, if it, like there's so many variables that we can do hours on just talking about what different variables might do to uh, the cook itself. But at the end, what you're trying to do is to caramelize in some way or form by cooking your agave. So you have terms like bien cocido that is like highly cooked and then you have a different kind of char on the on the agave itself and it looks just like caramel like that is the amazing part of this like when you see the pictures of these things when you smell them it has this kind of molasses uh charred sugar taste mm -hmm. and smell Gabo, and that's espadine that, that agave it's is espadine. It's espadine and you can actually the the fiber at this point is edible and this is the main point of all this. Like when you go to a mezcal one-on-one and, and you want to go to the core, core, core part of the name. And what does it mean? You know, and so there's, there's this is cook agave. That's what you mean in, in uh, ancient Nahuatl, Mexican, uh, Aztec, you know, you can, there's a bunch of different ways to say, it, but it's now for cook agave, mezcali. And what is going to end up is this. So this is the core to make sure that the fibers are open, the sugar is churned by cooking it, uh, being able to have this first part without the stone, the tajona that you hear, the see over here, that's the name of this uh, stone mill. It can be, there, there's different kinds of things, uh, different kinds of names depending on the type of mezcal that you're going to be certifying. This, for example, is an artisanal because it's going to use this handmade machine to crush the agave. So there's mezcal, mezcal artesanal, and mezcal ancestral. This denomination falls on and, and, and artesanal. The ancestral is the one that you will see pictures of people using these giant like baseball bats, smashing them in some sort of canoe or in the floor. So again, it goes from like the most 
simple way of doing something that is all by hand and then the implementation of a few of the machines. Hey, Gabo, I think too, actually, we go back two pictures for just a second, back sure. to the pit. So when people talk about, they think sometimes that mezcal is smoky, tequila is not smoky. Yes. Obviously, you've got all like the hammocks. You can see that these stones, as you've put the bagasse, the wet fibers, and then the, um, the piñas on them, you can see the kind of smoke coming off of it. But what happens after that is then you end up putting some fibers and then some plastic and then some dirt. And Lou was asking about those logs, that logs are bolstering up the dirt that's holding all of it. But you can very clearly see on the right, there's no smoke coming out. Not that smoke. fire has been put out. It's not smoky anymore. And you know, Monique, if there's a smoke, there's a problem. Because if there's smoke, there's fire. And if there's fire, something is burning. And you're exactly not, right. you, don't, you don't want to burn this. You want to you wanna use the core heat element that you have already there. To, to maintain as little possible of the oxygen that is there to just maintain the combustion going, but not the flame going. And that is a whole art on itself. You know, that, that is one of those things that is like generations and generations of past knowledge. So in the just learn the right touch. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, so then, okay. So then when people say it's smoky, are they wrong? Yes. No, because there's yes. a few, there's a few yes, elements. If, if it is a smoke, oh, prevaricate. Yeah, I will say, and this is this is the the duty of all of us as educators is is roasted. So yes, there's gonna be an element of 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 taste of the roast, but it's not the element that you have to focus on. It's a very simple thing, like saying you know that has been probably for all of us that there are a little bit geeks on on, on mezcal and all this is smooth and the use of, of the word smooth to just generalize oh. the, the, the element of like fattiness or the tenderness or the char all like there's all these other things that you know it's matter of having more education and more words it's, it's a language it's interesting that, like across all kinds of spirits categories people will say to me that a scotch is smoky or you know whatever and i'll say okay do you think that really um dark chocolate is smoky well no that's the flavor of dark chocolate or like coffee well no that's a dark roast coffee and so because we we just have more access to the terms i think in like chocolate because we drink it or coffee because we're sorry chocolate or because we eat it and so when you use this there's just a lot of things that people think of as smoky that are like roasted caramely but you know that there's there's a very and there's a very 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 important factor here do you know what cook agave tastes like because if you know Kevin, what it tastes, it tastes like, like, angels ought to taste like. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you know what it tastes oh. like, then your first thing is like, hmm, this tastes like our whiskey. Because that's how it tastes when you, you know, take a chunk of it. And it like, there's a specific flavor profile that unless you experience more, unless your, your, your palate is, uh, it has the experience to have this. And this can only happen if you're in Mexico. So please travel when it's safe. And, and, and experience this because this is, the, this is the aha moment for anybody that drinks mezcal or raicilla or sotol or bacanora or comiteco or there's many more. Um, that when you try this, you're like, this makes sense. You know, I, I'm just going to jump in here for a second, Gabo, because I got to say, if you go to the Cermak grocery stores in Chicago about once a year, and it's generally January, February timing, they actually sell little cellophane um, uh, packets of the cooked agave. And no it's, little, it's, it's, it's labeled mezcal, and you get it for like four bucks, five bucks, and you can just sit at home and chew on it and taste it. It's, it's lovely. You know what? You can probably go to California, chop an agave that is about to have a cute and put it in a hole, and maybe you will have something experienced like that. <laughs> <laughs> this other thing, uh, and it's, a, it's an important thing to say about agave. Agave doesn't know that you need a passport to actually grow somewhere else. Uh, I do have a few in my house. They're under a light. They don't know that they're not in Mexico, so they're, they're very happy. But it's one of those things that, you know, the, the, the important part of the denomination of origin is the cultural aspect that comes behind it and what it protects 
uh, in certain ways. That's a way more complex, and it can get very tricky to talk about it. So we just, so I just want to leave it just there. Well, it define you, you know what, but that's interesting, Gabo, because it does define what, you know, it, 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 it goes a long way towards defining what Mezcal is. So one of the discussions we had last week when we were talking about tequila are the different ways that things are processed. And you have shown us the most common way that things are processed. Are, are there other ways that A, you can process agave to make mezcal and sure. B, are there other ways that people do process it? And I'm mostly thinking about the cooking. In other words, would you cook mezcal in a traditional oven? Or are you always going to do it in the manner that you just demonstrated to us? Is sure. there another way you can process sugars out of agave? So you were talking about five to eight as a range, depending upon the farmer and so on and so forth. We talked about diffuser technology and diffuser process last week. Is there any way that you can do that with mezcal? I want to show you something that is very interesting. And it was probably one of those aha moments too for me. Uh, the mamposteria ovens, as you mentioned, you know, that they're heated by gas. But when I saw Rio's um, oven and the story behind it, uh, you can see this, right? It looks like a pizza oven. So mm -hmm. this oven is heated close. It gets really, really, really hot. Then they open it and there is a frenzy, a frenzy, uh, frenziness of pushing all the agave inside of it as fast as possible because the longer that you take by putting the agave, the lower the temperature starts dropping. Okay. And then you have an uneven cook or a difficult cook. And like, there's all these factors. So imagine, imagine the one that is on the floor while well, you, you're covering and kind of like protecting the heat already there. So it's easier. But then you start thinking about the, the, the multiple things of how, how fast does this oven has to be loaded in order to maintain the heat that then is gonna be there for you know the same five to seven days, 10 days, depending the temperature on the area. Uh, so uh, that is one. That is, are those ovens in Mascota? Where yeah. was that? Uh, no, these are in San Sebastián del Oeste. And then, let me see, I think there's another picture of that. So, so hey team, so would you say that <laughs> some of these different um, production, like processing methods and cooking methods, those are, not necessarily exclusive to mezcal. Well, they would be very rare in tequila, but mm -hmm. you know, not done very often in tequila, but it's not like it's black and white. I think we yeah, should not unheard of. I think we should point out though that until you know the mid 19th century, all tequila was cooked underground, period. So it's sure. not like they have always like most are, everyone gets very excited about brick oven tequila, and I do too when it's done by, you know, Cascapin and Fortaleza. But we should remember that that's already industrialization. Tequila was made exactly the same way as mezcal to the mid 19th century. And then for efficiency and for money, the brick oven became the thing. And then it became motoclave, and then it became diffuser. So in the current context, brick oven is seen uh, as like, wow, they're going the extra mile. But we, we should remember that originally they all worked exactly like the pictures that gabo has been showing. That was tequila 200 years ago. And then the yeah. world got excited. The world wanted more tequila, and they just simply had to figure out ways to make more faster. That's one way to look at it, Lou. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna go a little faster on this photo so we don't get a stock in this. So just the Tajona being work at the Palenque. Fermentation tanks that we can talk in a little bit about it, that I think this is the key point of taste, at least on my imagination, when I see all this happening visually. Don Octavio doing the checkup on that. Uh, the, the one, all these pictures, I think for me are very important to show when I'm talking about mezcal because it's concrete, bricks, water, heat, and a few humans, and copper. <laughs> so it's, it's a very simple elements. And these are already kind of stylized uh, uh, palenque. This already has a little more of a shape is not as archaic that you will find them. All this, a lot of them, they were made close to the water as any other moonshine situation uh, because you needed the water to be running in order to pull it down and do the condensation. 
teammates, family mates, the, the making of tequila, the making of tequila, the making of mezcal, the making of all the Mexican spirits is inclusive of probably all the town. It's, it's a, it's a, is the it's wash a, getting put into the still a, there with a wheelbarrow? That's fantastic. It's a joint effort of all this. You know, it's like it's one of the things that is amazing is to see when when we go and visit and 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 working with them and taking the photos and trying to figure out what is happening in front of you. It's like it's just the quotidianity of working with your family and with your town, and that is absolutely gorgeous to know that that comes after. You're going to be drinking basically the group effort of a town. Well, and you know, I. This is this is probably one of my favorite photos because it tells you how simple this is. It's a fork that is broken and kind of taped together. The one, you know, uh, stick that they use for the fermentation and moving some other things that they're getting charred. And that's it. It's like everything else is just manpower. And again, it's just, I always think, and I maybe that's the Bohemian part of it. The transfer, the transfer of energy from the person that is working towards the item that they're making, whatever that is. And therefore, maybe there's a little bit of Don Octavio every time you drink a little mezcal, you know? Mm -hmm. And the simplicity of the machines, you know, this is one of the, one of the palenques that we, we help build to the family. And, you know, it's a 280 liter tub, copper, bricks, concrete. That's it. You know, there's the, the simplicity of the machines as what you were saying, Brett, today, like the the how industrial at mezcal and how simplistic might be looking at, at mezcal. You know, the, the, that that is I think for me the the main crucial difference that with the denomination of origin and the way that the killer certificate they have been able to completely walk away by choice and by production and by multiple other needs probably of, of the market to to maintain the, the amount of liters that is needed to be sold versus something that, you know, the biggest batch that I've seen from the family is probably 1,800 liters. 1,900 well, but I mean, liters. And, that and, and that is a big batch, you know. For that not, specific family though, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not gonna talk about anybody else that right. I don't know much because I've, I feel that I will misrepresent, but I have a lot of information and a lot of really comfortable conversations with the family, and this <clears throat> we talk freely about it. So, so Gabo, so we're talking. So, one of the discussions we got on when, and it kind of got us off the tracks a little bit last week when we were talking about tequila, but it might be good to address here. There is now CRM, and there is now um, the, the the industry itself getting together to try to regulate. Do you see that doing anything to start to draw the producers away from traditional methods and to more industrial methods? Somewhat like you would make an argument that the CRT and everything put together to codify their rules were changed to benefit something you just said, which is, you know, all of a sudden everybody in the world wants tequila. How can we make more? Is there any movement afoot to do the same thing in Mezcal now that Mezcal is becoming popular? Hey, we need more Mezcal because none of these are really going to, none of this is scalable that we've seen so far. I mean, it is what it is. It's the family, it's the village and that's yeah. it. And you know, I think, I think, okay, let me, let me back the thought a little bit. So in the past six months, since COVID, I've been WhatsApping, talking, Zooming, contacting, talking, conversing, learning about the history of what I didn't know of Oaxaca and specifically on Matatlan, because this is the town that I work with and this is the town that I represent up here in the States in some way or form. The family that I work for and I work with and I'm part of I'm I'm the representative over here, so it was it was a very important thing for me, as part of a team and as part of a family, to be able to know all this part of the story. And it goes a little bit like this: there is a big, big problem in the early '60s, '70s, with the production of mezcal 
that it was adulterated, that where the production of mezcal, that it was done in very weird ways, that it was not well done, that it was not produced properly. Uh, with this, a group of people, uh, there is the initiative in, in the town of Matatlán at the beginning of creating and trying to consolidate the rules, the thoughts, the process. Uh, and there's a little bit of basically the background of what the CRM will become in some way or form. Uh, it's way more complex than that and, and really diluted it to something simple to understand, but it's towards a big, big problem that it became almost compromising to the limit of extinction of mezcal hmm. was what the people tried to figure out how to fix this problem. And right? so that was the beginning of CRM. That's my understanding and that's a personal understanding of okay. how every time I see and I hear the story, this is what it makes sense to me. There was a, a, a very, very complicated element of misuse of agave, misuse of technique, adding other sugars, making something that is not mezcal at all. It's a distillate of somehow, somewhere, uh, probably toxic, probably dangerous. Um, I have to tell you this, I'm, I'm 43 years old. I was born and raised in Mexico City. I tried mezcal for the first time that I understand what it was in my early 30s in Oaxaca in my 10 year anniversary with my wife. I grew up with it. I drink, mes I drink tequila in, and it was because I was probably lucky enough to have uh, a family from Jalisco next door and the, the garrafones, the plastic uh, 20 liter garrafones will come uh, with mezcal, with tequila to the house, probably very close to what mezcal will taste like at that point. But it was very important for me to understand that mezcal was not in the common sense of Mexican growing up. Like 80s, 90s, very, very, very rare that somebody will be tinged in a bar, whiskeys, tequilas on the higher end because they were getting the status that we know now as a, mm -hmm. you know, a higher, uh, a higher uh, denomination of, 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 of a liquor. But this, this is very, it makes so much sense when I hear the stories from the family, like, that's why he wasn't around, you know? That's why all this was completely, like, nobody wanted to even touch it with a 10-foot pole because... Unless you were from there. It was very localized then. Localized, the only, the, the mezcal was very localized. Very much with the, all the, you know, Mexico is probably 90% or 99% Catholic. So every single party, bautizo, 15 años, uh, somebody died. Everything was related to a party that mezcal was celebration. You know, my still, um, still celebration. But the, one of the things that you were saying that is kind of like important to say also because this is a mezcal one on one is when you hear all this story and you hear all this heritage, and then you think when you go to Oaxaca and the bottle that you're buying is priced higher than it was. And it was, it's probably priced higher up than the local consumption, at least from the brands, it's none. Like the towns that they used to drink mezcal end up drinking any other cheap alcohol because that's what they can afford. And that's kind of like very, like I think it's a very, very sad point. Um, most of the families that you see, or you hear on, on oh, the Maestro Mezcalero from X, Y, C brand, and the mezcal mezcalero from the other brand, all of them, I think, still, a lot of the a lot of the production obviously goes for the the international market now because we are probably what seventy percent exports now in mezcal making. So the very small trade that still happens is is very localized. Is not is not what you will think that oh they're making a lot of money because they're making this very expensive mezcal. The, the, there's like two completely different worlds. The one that we see here and we paid the top dollar for it and the one that's still kind of like in the in the makings of like the, the, the culture itself. Like, you know, there's there's these parties in, in Oaxaca called uh, Mayordomos. So you become the butler of the Niño Jesus of the town or the, the, the whatever the... the 
the Catholic Church saint that is part of that town, right? So there's this whole full year commitments and there's three parties. And one of the, one of the guys that works with us, uh, Luyo, was very excited, like, man, I'm gonna be, I'm being, I'm gonna be a mayordomo this year and I'm having all these, you know, major parties that I have to basically make my scalp for three or 400 people, you know? And, it's, it, and this is how it works, you know? The town provides to the people to, to for local consumption, but is is I'm I'm a little bit worried that that might not be the case anymore, and it might be getting compromised and more compromised. You know, it, well, it I mean, feels it it feels to me like we got like 15 minutes left, and I'd love to talk specifically with Ruble about how do you drink this stuff? Like I get that they're drinking and it's beautiful. They're drinking it for ceremonies and parties in the villages. How do we drink it here? Like right really here, fast, when we're here in really, Estereo. Can I ask you guys too, and Ruble certainly to address this, but I also think that one of the things I'm thinking back, like how did I make that transition? And I was running a bar, we had tequila. The only mezcales that we had when they first started coming always had a worm in the bottle. I was gonna Why ask was that? Thing. And that's, like, why, why you, was that? And what's you know happening got, with that now? That's how you know you've got a good bottle, Monique. <laughs> right, because the worm is authentic because, you know, the worm came right out of the agave. Well, the worm gave you superpowers. <laughs> right. I mean, look at me. I've eaten dozens of them. <laughs> well, you I have like not the <laughs> there's ever been an anti-drug ad more effective i'm not sure of one so that was just that was just all for show for years right i mean i my history with mezcal only goes back maybe 15 years and everything that we had when i first started working at Benny's was just a couple of cheap brands and they both had a worm in them I, i've heard i've heard both sides you know i've heard that it is tradition and i've heard that it was just for tourists i like i don't know if there's documentation to prove either way but you know, actually, I think there is some tradition to it. But let's like let's be honest, Monte Alban and all that stuff, like those were forty percent alcohol by volume, like artificially mm -hmm. colored. It's very clear what the worm was doing there. There was nothing traditional about it. It wasn't relating to any larger like historical or cultural story. It was to fool the gringos into buying this stuff. It's the it's mm -hmm. the wild, you know, it's the wild tequila. But like people like. There, there are mezcaleros who who say that the worm is traditional and you go to Chihuahua and I guarantee you, you'll see plenty of sotol with snakes inside of it. <laughs> well, you know, you also have the, the, the cultural background of a country that eats bugs in so many right. other ways. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so there's, there might be a tradition of eating the worm and drinking the mezcal, so why not just dropping the thing? So, Saves time. A, a numerous, a numerous <laughs> things might have happened, but this this was clearly an advertisement gimmick. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I think another quality was to preserve it. That I have heard the story of saying that oh, they put the worm to if it didn't dissolve is because it was good mezcal, you know, shit yeah. like that. And they, like it doesn't really work. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think other parts because I'm also interested in having since this is a 101. I think it is very important to talk about how how you consume mezcal what is you know mm -hmm. uh, what's a good way to start what's a good way to taste it what are its uses i think that some yeah. of the things around the development of crm and what crm may or may not be doing those were probably more appropriate for the for a, a, a further mm -hmm. so so michael what how, how are you doing mezcal except for ripping shots i uh <laughs> i do not i do not rip, rip shot nor recommend ever doing that um, but I would like to start by doubling back to Mezcal being tequila's smoky cousin, because this is a 101. And I will tell you that every, as someone who owns and operates a bar, it's a cliche that I hear every single night of my life. Mm -hmm. And so I think in a 101 discussion, we should really maybe accent it harder than we have. Smoking mezcal is bad mezcal. The mezcalero wants it to taste like their land. They want it to taste like their pueblo. It, when they want it to remind them of their grandfather. They, they, it's about all of these cultural, religious, and historical stories coming together. 
even like our very Western tasting notes. Oh, you know what? I could a hint of like lavender and this is chocolate. And if you say that shit to a mezcalero, they'll look at you like you're lost your fucking mind. Oh, please say fucking. <laughs> Sorry. They'll look uh, at you. It's like a lot of, that's a lot of swear words in a very short <laughs> period, Miguel. This might be why we had you on mute for so long. Yeah, well, I started that. <laughs> but I'm well, wait, Lou, please explain when, when, when you, when, when Michael wait. said that uh, a smoky mezcal is a bad mezcal, Lou lost his mind. Well, I didn't lose my mind. Like I've got a, I've, I've got like a piece of my mind that I lost, and and I lost it because, frankly, I like, I, I don't taste smoke anymore. I really don't, Wait. and I don't know if that's because I've been drinking these spirits for so long, or because I've got a big green egg in my backyard. Uh, this is a stereo, not my backyard, but in, in a big green oh. egg in my backyard that I, I do a lot of smoking with. But the point is, like, some people love the smoky taste. And by people, I'm not just talking about gringos. I'm not talking about us. I'm talking about some of the mescaleros that I have met like a smoky taste. And I'm, I don't feel, I mean, this feels to me like session three or four information. Michael, but, what? Michael, yep. what causes the smoke and why do you view it as a flaw? Cool, because I was in mid-thought. Um, and I really want to get back to it because uh, I was saying, I, I, I will stand by smoky mezcal is bad mezcal. Absolutely. This is not the way mezcaleros think about it. When you talk to mezcaleros, the one thing that never comes up is the word smoke. Ever. Ever. They never, ever talk about it because smoky mezcal is bad mezcal. But... So this cliche is everywhere. How did it get to be everywhere? Are people just crazy? Why does everyone say, and even like repute, like good drink writers that we all respect say, so mezcal is tequila smoky cousin. A lot of the cocktail mezcal is that hit the market. No one says this, but it's time that someone just said it out loud. A lot of the cocktail mezcal is that hit the market are brought down to lower proof with a lot of tails. A lot of the end of the distillation run. Those mezcales, because tails are full of this really like barbecued meat kind of flavors um, and a lot of off flavors, those cocktail mezcales taste like burnt shit. They do taste like smoke. People didn't make this up. The problem is a lot of people's first mezcales, and I'm not going to name brands, are brands that have a lot of these flavors in them. They are off flavors. Oh, but Miguel, I'm going to throw a flag at you. And we should save this. We should park this particular debate until at least session three. But now getting rid of the idea of for smoke the longest time, you couldn't good. use tails. You couldn't use tails. You literally could not pass certification if you use that much tail in your production. OK, it's all yours, Miguel. I'm going to then mute tell, myself. Then tell me how Vita is 42 percent alcohol by volume and has no water. I didn't make it. You'll have to ask the people who did. But you could not use tails because of the acid content. It would literally not pass muster. Okay, all yours. I want to hear what Gabo has to say about this. Yes, yeah, Gabo's, yeah, Gabo's jumping in. Here. I'm being very quiet. <laughs> now, I'm trying to think the best way to put this, but when you're starting to taste something new, whatever that is, you're going to go to the one thing that you recognize first, but mm -hmm. not necessarily what is actually tasting like. So mezcal has, if you want to call it like music, different textures. It has different sounds, different colors, different aromas, different everything. So when you're drinking whatever it is, it doesn't really matter if it's high end, low end. I will think that even in the in the forty percent, Michael, I will think that you will. If you put an effort, you will find a little bit of the essence of the agave. Uh, so the deal is try to find the plant, trying to taste the plant, try to taste what you're meant to look for is, is, is a very, is, again, is it like, you know, I, I love using this phrase of pursuit of taste is because it's really not simple. It's an educated palate that you're going to go you know, I, and again, we were having the conversation of espadines. Just just by going through the market of all the espadines, you don't need to spend the the eighty uh, to a hundred dollar yet. You want you want to trace your mouth and you want to try to understand what mezcal is. 
just go through all the spadin that is in the market and you're gonna figure out, okay, so there's a reason why all these things take different, different towns, different mezcaleros, different tasteful. So now I'm gonna go farther, a little bit farther out on the mezcal one-on-one of this, the shape of what you're drinking. Lou has a bucket that probably allows him to put all his face in and that's a whole completely different experience from you know a three ounce uh, three ounce belladora or a copita that is made out of a, a fruit gourd that it will probably sip absolutely everything that you have inside of it or if you're using glass that is non-porous so it doesn't absorb neither change the flavor or if you use a beautiful copita from Tuyo that is made out of high temperature porcelain <laughs> and it has this very specific shape. Uh, so we were doing a little bit of an experiment at a, a local place over here. Uh, we're friends from Loncheria that we love and, and work a lot with them and in New York, in Brooklyn. And we put two different spirits in two different vessels. So we have a veladora and a copita shape and we have a quiche and a criollo from Guerrero, that it was a very interesting thing. You know, all mezcales, they all, both of them taste completely different. Uh, but they both of them taste completely different in the in the four, you know, combinations that you have, two and two. So I will say, if you want to go a little bit farther out and you already taste all the espadines that you want, now start experimenting a little bit with, with the type of basil that you're going to use to drink. Uh, that will put you in a place that the concentration of aromas changes, the concentration of amount that is going to your mouth changes. Um, if you have something that have a, a small curvature will allow you to sip it. Like it will force you to actually get it out of the mm -hmm. thing. When you have a glass like that, that is in, in an angle that is open like this, the liquid will probably rush into your mouth that is a whole different story that it works for a whiskey for example that's what we figure out you know it like there was this one thing that is like on the copita that the, the flavor kind of like mellows down but it's really nice it allows you to smell it better but the flavor that you want on the Karwinski was a little bit washed with the with the with the too much air right and then when we did the veladora like you put you, you do the first sip and it was like whoa it's just concentrated so again Personal, personal, personal. It's a personal experience of discovering taste in every single of the varieties. I, I think too, out in the in the Q and A, John Henry added that like when you really like barbecue, you don't always say all barbecue tastes like smoke. You can taste the different types of meat, and so there's roasty flavors, but you don't say oh all barbecue is smoky. You know, you associate it with with the meat that you're cooking, how you cook it, the sauce that you're cooking, how long it was smoked, like all of those different things. But we've just got so much more of a um, fluency in the language surrounding barbecued meat that you don't have yet if you haven't had roasted agave and, and consumed a lot of mezcal. Really, I, I just want to add like really smoky brisket is bad brisket. Go no, ahead. no, I love smoky no. brisket. John Henry well, here's is the question, just... his questions. I love John Henry's questions. I love just... every single one of them. Okay, now I'm going to mute myself again. I like your background. Well, like, just uh, uh... Michael, just to, to clarify housekeeping to make sure we're all clear, you, you were talking about the, um, some of the mezcals that one level of inferiority or, or connect the dots for us, one level of inferiority being a lower alcohol content. So A, are you allowed to dilute mezcal and B, with water, which, and then B, you know, it sort of explain, uh, yeah. the faints will be for another thing, but are you allowed to dilute mezcal with water to bottle proof. Okay, so th th these are really good questions. And um, there's nothing wrong with diluting with water and there's nothing wrong with diluting with tails. Uh, and as for what you can dilute with, you can do it with anything you want. But Lou is right, if you're certifying, you're gonna have to be very careful how far you go into the end of the distillation run, what is called in, in, in Espanol colas or the tails, because you will not pass the test. This is true. But so when it comes to traditional mezcal, um, like Pedro Jimenez at Misonte or the good people at Mezcal Ateca, they, they, they publish sort of rules to go by for traditional mezcal and certainly people will argue about them and it's probably even someone on this panel who will argue with me uh, about them. But I, I think they're pretty good places to start. 
they suggest that traditional mezcal can't be less than 45% alcohol by volume. They suggest that the, the distillate, when dropped into your hands and rubbed, you can smell, you, you can be aware of, of the aroma of cooked agave. I think these are, are really good things to go by. Uh, and to tie up with my earlier point, I think unfortunately mezcales that, that are brought to the, the market strictly for cocktails, and there's nothing wrong with a mezcal strictly for cocktails and strictly for commercial purposes. But if that's your only experience with mezcal, you have never actually tasted mezcal. And then can somebody real quick, Michael, can you mm. say again um, a little bit slowly or can somebody type in one of our questions was about education material. So if somebody could type in the two things you just referenced as pieces for education material. Yeah, uh, so what I pointed to actually was uh, Gabo and his wife do this great podcast series called Hey, Hey, Agave. You've got like, what, 23 episodes so far? And, and they're long, like hour, hour 15 interviews with people who run the gamut of the industry. So you get a really interesting perspective on, on different people and different facets of the industry. And then I am a huge fan of Sarah Bowen's book, Divided Spirits, which I think really covers the history of agave spirits in a beautiful way. Um, and, and, and brings it up to the whole point of uh, denomination of origin. Um, so those, like that, that to me would be the two places to start. I think Emma Jansen's book is a great introduction to mezcal. Uh, Emma Jansen's book, Mezcal, is fantastic. And for those of you who are looking at 301, read Jay Schroeder's Understanding Mezcal. Schrader. I always say his Schrader. name wrong. Yeah. The it's other, just like uh, the, wa the uh, former uh, Washington uh, Redskins quarterback. There's, there's one, <laughs> one factor that we haven't talked and is very, very important before we run out of time. Uh, the NUM, what that means then is, is Norma Oficial de Mexico. So the law itself that regulates mezcal in some way or form and the body that enforces it, that is the CRM. Mm -hmm. So these two things are very important to say because it can be a lot of talking about back and forth, but the law itself says that through a series of detailed elements will tell you that that is how you are able to export and call your product mezcal outside Mexico. Like anything that we get in the country has to be certified in order to say mezcal. Mm -hmm. And that's the rule. And, and it's, you know, there's, there's many, many things that can be better. There's many, many things that it can improve. We're talking about also a very young institution and in, and to be all honest like were you drinking mezcal 10 years ago no very few of us were doing something like that yeah and gabo so, gabo where would you reference that material what would be the easiest way to find that let me look for it i will send you something and we can we can send it out but lou might have a few documents i might have a few documents i don't have them in front of me so i don't want to say oh just go to that but if you put num n o n that's you know norma oficial uh, of Mexico, and and that will that will come in. The norm I think is zero seventy, right, Lou? Uh, seventy, yeah, yeah. So in fact, like, so for my nonprofit, Sacred Agave, look at that at Sacred Agave. If you go to sacred.mx, if you scroll to the bottom, you'll see what is mezcal. You click on that, and I created this very long spreadsheet that literally breaks down each of the different gnomes to explain the difference between mezcal, tequila, bacanora, sotal, pulque, like I, I, whiskey, like all of that within Mexico. And it includes links to all of the gnomes that you're talking about, Gabo, so that if you want to read for yourself the actual language of what the Mexican government said defines mezcal, defines tequila, defines sotal, defines bacanora, you can read that. Okay, and then Michael, and then Michael, um, again, can you just repeat your two references for uh, Mezonte and Mezcalo, the other? A beautiful tasting room in Oaxaca, where, where everyone who goes to Oaxaca should spend, make an appointment, spend an afternoon and taste. Uh, Mezonte is in Guadalajara, and it's just one of the most beautiful projects. Um, oh. In all of Mexico, like what Pedro Jimenez has been doing for distillates 
in Alisco that are not allowed to call themselves Perecilla. They can't call themselves mezcal. They can't call themselves tequila, but they are beautiful things that, that they call mezcal. Uh, I call them mezonte. <laughs> there you go. Uh, mezonte, a beautiful tasting room. And there's a dive bar next door. If you go to Guadalajara, it's only open either Thursday through Saturday or Wednesday through Saturday. They kind of change the hours depending on how they feel. But go to Par de Sufrir. It's one of the best bars in the world, not one of the best bars in Guadalajara, but one of the best bars in the world. But check out Pedro Jimenez. He also has uh, videos on YouTube. You can learn a lot from that guy. He's a really smart dude. All right, so we got some reading material, hopefully, uh, to study up on for next week. Uh, Gabo, thanks for all these behind the scenes shots. I think, um, you know, something that gets kind of lost with the transition from tequila to mezcal is all of a sudden it seems like you're paying twice as much for a bottle and when you really think about it though I mean you see what goes into this these are you know there's a lot of commonalities with wine John Henry had pointed that out too you know where they're so terroir driven and yeast driven and there's just and batch driven I mean so you, you're, you're dealing with handmade stuff on stills that small you know you're going to expect batch differentiation with it and and you, you know unfortunately you got to expect that you know, you're going to have to pay a little more for it when they can only make maybe a couple hundred liters at a time. And, can you know, I just, I want to flag, bottles. can Go I ahead, flag the word unfortunately? Because I don't think it is unfortunate. I think it's oh, not unfortunately, but it's like, like, it's one of those things where, you know, you just got to expect to pay for it. You know, as yeah. with all things, you know, there's uh these are, these are high quality handmade artistic things. And but you, know, you know what, Pat, also, that is a, a very important thing to say. Uh, because it comes from the from the country that it comes from, mm -hmm. there's this cultural glass ceiling that is there, and it's complicated just to even think about it. Because it's like, well, I can pay you know eight hundred, nine hundred dollars for a Japanese whiskey, but whoa, will I pay that same amount for a Mexican mezcal? That's a good point. Yeah. You know, what that is, to be all honest, add pair and you know you will play with it. But the, the other thing that I think, um, with Mezcal and I think with all, all the things that we talk about, the very conscious understanding that it comes from another country, that is very, very, very important because we see this with our eyes here, with our experiences here, with our bars, with our tastings, with our restaurants, with our business here but mm -hmm. it comes from somewhere else and that is something that it has to be respected honor work mm -hmm. with and understand in so many levels i think it's the the, the mezcal one-on-one -on, -one on the purest way of form is respect the country that it comes from and the culture that is being given to you mm -hmm. it's, amen yeah. Yeah. it's not it's not it's not just a commercial commodity right mezcal is something that is from the very roots of the cultural traditions of the places that it is made. Can't every be. is distinct, every pueblo is different. It's linked to all of these long traditions. It is of a place and time, perhaps in a way that no other spirit is. You know, pay what you will for Japanese whiskey. There's mm -hmm. no sense of, of terroir in those grains, right? In the yep. plants, in Solo de Vega, it's a very different story. Mm -hmm. They don't have to stay up, you know, all night for a couple of nights to distill in Japan, and they certainly do in Solo de Vega. And Michael, saying saying terroir in mezcal, just to be super clear with everybody and have this as as an understanding, you're talking about the plant growing, not the land. The, it's part of the land growing, but where like the amount of years that this plant is acquiring. Mm -hmm. in, in growing and, t and what is end up going to be a, a part of the taste experience that you're going to have. Exactly. So all, 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 of the, all of the rain showers, all the sun, all the sunsets, all the animals, it's not nine months of grain, it's seven, eight, 15, 25 years of cultural history yeah. is embedded in, in that plan. And that's why this drink is so much more complex than any drink you'll ever have in your life. What are you saying, Lou? I just can't wait for like episode four because like we're just gonna blow all this up, just like blow it all up. 
Well, until next week when Lou blows it all up. So, no, no, no. Thanks for no, joining no. us tonight. Number this four. has been fun. Okay, and by I, two weeks. Two weeks. Next week. Blows it all up. I believe next week we're just starting to have a discussion about ordinary you know, um, artisanal. Well, yeah, we're going to talk it, how to read a Mezcal label. You know, we it, talked it, what Mezcal is today, and we're going to go over, you know, how to dissect what you see on the shelves and what you see behind bars into the drinking experience you're looking for. And we welcome an actual mescalero on the show. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a great guest. Up. I'm not going to let Lou blow it up next week. I'm going to make okay. sure Lou No, no, it's two weeks. With us. Two weeks. Yeah, in two weeks, maybe. But next yeah, week, okay. we're not going to let you blow it up. Stay strong, Mal. Stay strong. All right. I've got well, you. until I've next got Monday, we'll be back next Mezcal Thank Monday. You, uh, Brett and I will be back on Wednesday and Friday this week Thank with you, Mr. Blender from MGT. Thank you so much. It has Indiana, been talking bourbon and rye. Whoa, whoa, you're, you're talking to the dudes from the place that makes all of the bourbon. Last thing, I want to say thank you so much, Sabine, because we have been working with you guys for eight years. It sounds simple. We have been with you guys for that long, and it's meant something that it has to be said for you guys to be part of the mezcal community and being able to bring spirits for the people. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate well, it. Good mezcal. You, Easy to sell. Thanks a lot, Cheers, guys. Thanks again, everyone. See you next Cheers. Week. Have a good Gracias evening. Gracias a todos. I'm back Michael. to my grapes. <laughs>